Okay, so um, the topic today is um, Ash Wednesday, Lent, and Easter. And what we're looking at here is how did we start from um, the, the early church's Passover and get to Easter and all these other things that we see attached to it. And, and so we're going to look at that. This will definitely be a two-part. Um, there's a whole pile of information to go through here. Uh, mostly we'll focus on Easter, but we'll get into Ash and Lent a little bit later on. They came later in history anyway. So this is really a history study of how all these things came to be and uh, what people did to make them happen. So the roadmap here is um, the early church kept Passover. We'll look at that and we'll see some verses from the Bible and we'll see some other things that, that make it certain that the, the early ch church definitely kept Passover. Um, and then we'll look at the Church of Rome and they start moving days around on the calendar and their focus is to move everything to, to a Sunday. Uh, because they've decided Sunday is the better day. And uh, that starts a big fight within the church uh, because they do that and it ultimately results in parts of the church splitting off. And so uh, when they start doing that, the people who are the esteemed leaders, the people who are the, the top of the um, understanding uh, of uh, theology are, say, this is wrong, what are you doing? Um, and nonetheless, Rome continues doing it. So. And then we'll take a look at, at why Rome was moving days around on the calendar, because I think there's some understanding there that, that helps to, to not justify what they did, certainly, but to, to see what they did and maybe understand it from their perspective. But it, what they did was still wrong. And, and then we'll look at the First Council of Nicaea, which locked that Roman date into Christianity. And, and that's why we have that the current calendar dates for all of this Easter stuff that happens, Good Friday and Easter. And then once we get past that, almost certainly not this week, uh, we'll look at Lent and where did that come from and when did that come into, the, into Christianity. And then we'll look at Ash Wednesday and also where did that come from and when did it come into Christianity. I understand. There's some um, biblical versions or Bible versions that have the word Easter in it, <clears throat> but because most of them do not. And I think somebody said it. Sneaked it in or snuck it in? Or... We're actually going to touch on that. Um, the, the Bible has been modified over time in small ways, uh, and people have put in their own spins. Um, sometimes that just happens in the English translation, but it's actually happened in the Greek sometimes as well. So, yeah, we'll bump into that topic here about what did they do to hide some of the things that they did. Okay, so first of all, this this idea that the early church kept Passover is supported in lots of different ways. And, and the, the word Passover that we use actually from Hebrew is Pesach. And Pesach means passing over. And so that relates back to the original Passover when the angel of death passed over those houses that had the blood on the lintels and on the doorposts of the houses. And so Passover is a perfectly good English word that means the same thing as Pesach. Um, later, um, the people, uh, God's people, the Israelites, started speaking Aramaic rather than Hebrew, and Aramaic is a sister language of, his, of Hebrew, and the word in Aramaic is Pasha, and, and that word went into the Greek literally, and so if you, if you look at the Greek, you'll see that Pasha is the word that is used there, um, and so I, I hope that makes some sense. So the Hebrew word Pesach became Pasha in Aramaic, and it was transferred directly into Greek and also into Latin. And so when you look in the Roman Catholic Church, they'll still refer to Passover as Pasha, uh, even though they'll spell it in Greek. So uh, that's where the names come from. Um, we know that Jesus kept the Passover, um, but he was a Jew. He wasn't a Christian. That might seem like a strange thing to say, but it, but it, it is correct. Um, we are Christians because we are followers of him. We are Christ followers. Um, so um, what we see from the uh, Bible specifically is that Paul was arranging his life around the feasts and, and the feasts were important to him. And there's a number of verses that talk about that. The first one here comes from Acts 18 and it says, um, this is, uh, Paul is on one of his trips, uh, big uh, worldwide, well not worldwide trips, but long distance trips around the world spreading the gospel. And he's about to come back. And, and uh, so this verse here says, and they were asking him to tarry with them, to stay with them. And he did not consent. And he said, I must always observe the coming feast in Jerusalem. And if God wills, I shall return to you again. So there he's uh, saying it's important to him to go to Jerusalem for the feasts. Uh, and, and we see that in other places, too, that that was something that was important to him was to be there for those. And then in Acts 18, again, a little earlier, uh, it says, 
For Paulus, Paul, was determined to pass by it to Ephesus, lest he be delayed there because he was hurrying, that if he were able, he would keep the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. So Pentecost was important to him um, to, to be in Jerusalem, and that was what he was headed to Jerusalem for. That was important to him. So we see that Paul was, it was important to him to be keeping those feast days. And, um, and we see another place also in Acts um, where um, they are keeping the feast. And this one is from Acts 20. And, and what's happened here is they're, they're returning home from Greece. Um, and the two, the whole team, he's got something like 10 members of his, of his team. And the team splits into two. And some of them stay in one city. And another one head off to another city. And this happens just um, before one of the feast days, the Passover feast day. And uh, so what happens is they make a point of not traveling on the feast days. And, and because you weren't supposed to travel on the feast days, there were supposed to be days of rest that you didn't do any big traveling on. And so half the team stays in, in one city and uh, the other team goes, but this is before Passover, goes to another city and they, they both stay in those cities. And then after the feast day, the feast of unleavened bread, which is related to Passover, um, once that is done, then they continue their travels again. So I'll just read that verse. Um, it says, part of Paul's team went before us and waited for us in Troas, but we departed from Philippus, the city of Macedonia, after the days of unleavened bread. So they waited until the days of unleavened bread were, were done. And, uh, and those are the seven days that follow after Passover. And it says, and we went to, by sea and came to Troas in five days and remained there seven days. So uh, they were avoiding travel on during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is what you're supposed to do. But the, the very best evidence that the early church kept Passover actually comes from the fight that the Roman Catholic Church uh, invoked when they started changing the dates around. Because then it became obvious uh, because people were writing about it. There's a lot of um, written documents that we have that talk about this thing and the, and the fight that came out of it. So we have writings from that um, that, that tell us that, about it and we know that the church had been keeping Passover. And so the Catholic Church from their perspective they admit that they changed the date for it. In fact, they changed the date for it twice. And we'll see that as we go through the details of this. And, and they do it, or did it, they say, because they believe the Pope had the authority to make that change. They see the Pope as having the same power, the same authority that Jesus had on earth. We don't agree with that at all. Um, but, but nonetheless, they believe that the Pope had authority to, to make that change. The problem here, though, is that they didn't have Popes at that time. Um, popes were an idea they came up with a few hundred years later, and, and then they started declaring the previous heads of the church to be to have been popes, even though they never were called popes then. And this backdating is something we're going to see in a number of different places, where the Roman Catholic Church changes things and then kind of adjusts sometimes the translations of Bible and sometimes their documents to make it look like things happened earlier than they did. And one of those is they claim that they were uh, that a church was started by Peter, but there's no evidence that Peter was ever there. But they believe that their whole authority for their popes came from Peter, and, and so they've kind of backdated this pope idea to be as though they there were popes right from the very start that Peter had created there. And so, not having changed the date though, even though they changed it twice, they still called it Passover. And we'll see that that kind of becomes silly with their last change. But they still, to this day, Pasha is the official word that's used in, in Greek within the uh, Roman Catholic Church for Passover. Now, the first person that gets into this fight is, is a man called Polycarp. Polycarp is a, is a very special person. And, and uh, it, around 155 AD, um, he's the only person living who had known and met with and studied under the apostles. And he was the most knowledgeable person, and, and everybody said that about him. He was an authority on theology. He knew what was up, and, and nobody questioned his authority. Um, but um, well, almost nobody did. I guess the Roman Catholic Church did. But he was that. He had a lot of authority because he had been a person who had actually studied with the apostles, and, and that gave him uh, credibility with most people. And also, the apostles had made him the bishop of one of those seven churches. If, if you mention, remember the, in Revelation, it talks about those seven churches. One of those churches was the, the he was the bishop of that church. And, um, and so he had, because he was made a bishop by the apostles, and because he was a bishop, and because he had known and worked with the apostles, he had a lot of credibility. And, and he's... Um, very old when this dispute breaks out um, and, and his time and, and it becomes necessary for him to travel to Rome. 
but first of all, a little more about Polycarp. Um, his name is a Greek name. Um, I'm not sure of the translation of it, but to me it looks like Polycarp, which would be many fish. I'm not sure if that's true or not. Um, but in any case, <laughs> that's, that's the first thing you think of. <laughs> so in, in any case, whatever that might be, um, uh, it, it's, so it's believed that he was Greek by birth and, and, and not a Jew. Nonetheless, he was a bishop of um, a, a church which is in the area just in Asia Minor, which is just north of Israel. And he authored epistles. Uh, we know that he authored a number of epistles, but only one of those ever survived uh, to our time. And that was a, an epistle that he wrote to the church in, in Philippians. The, remember, there's a Philippians book. He also wrote a, a letter to that church warning them about um, people who were coming in with bad teachings and uh, to avoid those bad teachings. And so that was kind of a role that he had there was he was sort of the person watching over the churches uh, to, to help them get out of the problems that they got into, especially with bad teachers coming in and bringing in uh, false teachings. Okay, um, so what happens here in this fight is that word gets around to Polycarp that, uh, that the Church of Rome is having trouble. And the trouble that they're having is that they can't keep out false teachings. Um, Rome is not just the center of the world at that time. It's also the center of the religious, religious world. So anybody who wanted to bring in a new religion would take it to Rome. And, and Rome, the Church of Rome, found itself unable to keep out false teachings. And, and that is their character even to today. Um, their, their whole story throughout their existence has been that they couldn't keep out false teachings. And, and they allowed them to come in. And um, even recently, uh, like I think it was three years ago, the Roman Catholic Church had a big thing at the Vatican, um, a big conference. And the highlight of that conference, was, or the focus of that conference, was going to be South American Catholics. And, and so a whole bunch of South American Catholics came up to the Vatican, and they brought with them this Papa Mama, which was an idol. <laughs> it's, 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 it's an idol from South America. Um, and it's a fertility goddess, if I remember correctly. And they came in carrying this thing on their shoulders, brought it into the Vatican. And of course, the people in Rome were horrified by this because it wasn't one of their idols. They have accepted idols, but this was not one of their idols. And, and, and so um, they, they were horrified by the whole thing. And by, uh, by cover of darkness at night, a whole bunch of them got together and took the thing and threw it in the river. Um, but that, uh, the, very, the very top echelons of the Church of Rome, which are very liberal now, uh, were horrified by that. And they went and dug it out of the river again and propped it back up. This is only three years ago, you said? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this still goes on. <laughs> and, and, but yeah, the whole point here is, throughout their existence, they haven't been able to keep false teachings out. And so every week, it's like there's a new false teaching that creeps into the Roman Catholic Church, and, it, and it's always been that way. Whenever they went out to uh, bring the gospel message, they always allowed the people to keep some parts of their old religion, and those things continued on. And sometimes they even got right into the heart of Catholicism. So um, that's always been a problem that they've had, and it, and it continues on. So, that, yeah. That reminds me of the Nicolaitans, right? Yeah. Yeah, and any teaching that the Roman Catholic um, Church heard, they seem to keep part of. And, and um, let me, I, I won't go off track. <laughs> I'll try not to go off track. We're going to be long here anyway. So um, at this time, they, they were still suffering from that exact problem. There were a number of people coming in who were teaching things that were false, and they were just not able to stop it. Their, their members of their congregation were starting to adopt these new uh, teachings that were false, and, and they didn't seem to be able to keep anything out. And, and, and as I said, that's an ongoing problem. And, and this was causing them to factionalize, to split into groups um, based on theological lines because there were some people in the church who wouldn't accept these things that were being taught. They could see that they were wrong and there were other people who were accepting them. But nobody seemed to have the authority within the Roman Catholic Church to say this is right and this is wrong. Um, so um, to go and, and deal with the, what was happening there, Polycarp, who was an old man at the time, he was like 80-something at the time, um, he had to make a long trip um, from Asia Minor uh, to, over to Rome to go in and fight against these problems that they were working on and, and struggling with. And, and, um, but he, there were other things he needed to deal with, too. And, and so while he was in Rome, he met with um, the person who is now called the Bishop of Rome all that time. Um, he was uh, called Anicetus. Uh, that was his name. And um, he, he met with him, 
And uh, he told him that what you're doing is wrong. He said that all of the apostles had always observed Passover just at the same date that the Jews did on the 14th of the Hebrew month of Nisan. And it had never been any different. Um, he'd never known anything different. And he said, who are you to change the date? What are you doing? Um, and and Anicetus um, agreed, yeah, I know that that's true, what you're saying, that the apostles always kept it on, the, on that date. But he said, um, we've decided that we're going to celebrate it on the Sunday after Passover. And we did that some time ago, and I just couldn't possibly change it. And, and so he really didn't have the will to change it either. Um, and, and as you can see, that's that same spirit in Rome of things creeping in and nobody's able to get them out. So um, he, he rejected what he was being told by Polycarp, and uh, they celebrated communion together and went their own ways. But this resulted in a split between Rome and what's called the Eastern Churches. And later on, I'll have a map, and I'll show you how this all maps out on the, on the map. Um, and, and what happened is the Eastern Churches stopped accepting anyone from Rome and wouldn't allow them to teach in their churches. So if somebody from Rome came to, to visit, and you might normally invite them to preach a message uh, uh, in the church. They wouldn't do that. They wouldn't accept them because they'd come from Rome, because they saw what was happening in Rome with all the false teachings coming in. And so, but... Uh, the Catholic Church made him a saint, and, and um, they, they called him Saint Polycarp, and they have, even have a feast day, feast day on their calendar, which is Polycarp's Day. So, so they kind of accepted him, although they had rejected what he taught, which is kind of an odd thing. And, and so they consider him to say, a saint to this day. So summarizing Polycarp's experience, um, his point was the date matters, and it matters because God set, said there's a date for it. There's a right date, and there's uh, all the other dates. Um, and so the Church of Rome had moved Passover at this time from the 14th, um, which would call, could fall on any day of the week, and, and they'd moved it to Sunday. So it was always going to be on Sunday from that time on. Later on, they're going to make another change and move the date. But this was their first change, was just moving it to the Sunday following Passover. And so the, the, the Church of Rome, um, which we know them from as the Bible, later on they adopted the name Catholic Church. And Catholic means worldwide. And so they, they considered themselves to be the worldwide church. And, and so they, they were moving many other observances to Sunday. It wasn't just this. Um, they, they moved uh, the Feast of Weeks uh, later on to, to Sunday, and it, it's what we call Pentecost now. And, and they moved the Sabbath to Sunday as well. We know that one well, that they, they did that. And, and so there was an ongoing movement to move everything to, to Sunday, and that was because Sunday was their preferred day. And it was their preferred day um, for a number of reasons. We'll talk about that in just a moment. I'll get into that. Um, but uh, so not long after Polycarp returned from meeting with uh, Anicetus in Rome, he was caught and he was executed for being an atheist. Okay, that might seem crazy. Um, but he was an atheist because his religion wasn't one of the accepted religions in Rome. The Roman Empire had designated certain religions that were acceptable and certain and anything else wasn't acceptable. And so he was considered to be an atheist. What had happened there is that the Jews had said these new Christians are not part of Judaism. They are some other religion. And the Roman or the Rome had decided, yes, they're not one of the accepted religions. And so Christianity became an illegal religion in all of the Roman Empire. And, and so you could be executed for that, and that is what happened to Polycarp. Um, they tried to get him to recant, but he wouldn't recant, and so they, they burned him at the stake. And, and that was a common thing. Uh, Nero was uh, the first of the emperors that came after the Bible times, and he burned lots and lots of Christians for all sorts of places and reasons. So the same people that later made him a saint executed him for being an atheist? This is mind-blowing, you know? <laughs> it, yes, um, and, and the Church of Rome uh, and the Roman Catholic Church that came out of it was not against killing people. Um, they, they didn't actually, they tried not to keep their, or they tried to keep their hands from getting dirty and actually doing the deed themselves. But they would mark out, this person is worthy of death, and then somebody else would execute him. So, um, but it was still in, in their hands. They still controlled it. So, yeah, that, the Roman Catholic Church has had a long history that isn't good. So um, that's what happens to Polycarp in the end. Now we'll look a little bit at why were they changing the date? Why was Sunday such a big deal to them? Um, and they were moving other things to Sunday too. And, and they never say why. There's, there's no written document saying why we're doing this. Why are we moving these dates around? Um, but we know some things about them, and so we can kind of take a look at some of the factors that were involved in why they were changing the date. 
and one thing that we know is Romans disliked Jews, and, and, and especially Jews, but not just Jews, but anybody who kind of lived in that area around Israel. Um, they thought of those people as, as less, lesser beings, and they thought of the Jews in particular as rabble-rousers, and we see that from the Bible. They were always having some sort of a fight with Rome. They, the Jews didn't accept Rome ever, and, and it was a constant thing. Ultimately, um, the Jews, after, this is after Jesus' time, they, the Jews got together and, and kicked the Romans out of, Rome, out of Jerusalem, and um, the, of course, Rome didn't accept that, and they put together a bigger force, and they came in and conquered Jerusalem and destroyed the place. So, um, but that had been the nature of Israel and the other people, the Aramean people around them, and they didn't like them because of that. They, their rejection of Roman rule was part of the problem there. And so the people in Rome who lived in Rome and were part of the Roman church came out of that same thinking that those the Jews were a lesser people and the people who lived around there were lesser peoples. And you see that reflected in the writings of the early Christian writers. A lot of them show definite anti-Semitic beliefs. They, they didn't like the Jews at all, and they said a lot of horrible things to them. And the Christian church became an anti-Semitic church because of this, and, it, and that continued on until the end of World War II. Um, even at the time of the Protestants, um, um, who was the first Protestant? I've forgotten now. Anyway, um, he uh, wrote specifically about the Jews, and he said some very negative things Martin about them. Luther? Martin Luther, yeah. Yeah, he said some very negative, very, very anti-Semitic things about Jews uh, as well. And uh, so it was something that stayed in the church for a long period of time. Um, so um, one question we might ask that shows us that view that they had about other people, um, what you can see in the book of Romans from the Bible. In that epistle, you can ask the question, why does this epistle focus so much on the role of the Jews in Christianity? Because that's something that Paul goes to a lot of the time. And he talks about um, the Jews being the tree and, and branches being cut off so that others could come in and, and the, the talks to the Romans about you shouldn't be arrogant that you were grafted into that tree and all that sort of stuff. And, and throughout a big part of the book of Romans, he's talking about their relationship with Jews and where Jews belong in the church. But Rome ultimately never accepted that idea. They wanted to be their own church. They, they wanted to be uh, not based on Judaism at all. They wanted to think of themselves as something new and different. And so that was part of the reason why they were changing these dates is to look different. They didn't want to look like uh, Jews. They didn't want to be seen by others in Rome as Jews. And so they were moving observances to Sunday and, and uh, so that they wouldn't look so much like Judaism. So other possible factors here is uh, for centuries, the god Saturnus, uh, who we call Saturn, had, had been the, the big cool god uh, for Romans. Um, they had lots of gods, uh, Zeus and all those others, you, you may know the name of them. Um, but the, the one at, um, about Jesus' time was, um, the cool god was Saturn. But that was changing right at this time in history when Polycarp is here. Um, the, the, all of Rome has kind of decided that a new god is the, the great new god, and this god is Sol Invictus, um, which means the invincible sun. And so um, he was now the cool god, and his day was Sunday. We get that name from there. And, and we got Saturday from Saturn Day. Um, and, and so they, the Roman world was moving to Sunday because uh, Sol Invictus was now the cool god to have as your god. And, um, and so these changes of moving things to Sunday made Christianity more acceptable to Romans. And so they were making these changes in the hope of attracting more people into their church because they were worshiping on the same day and doing everything else on the same day as Sol Invictus' day. So that's another factor in, in the world that may have caused them to make some of these changes. That doesn't mean the changes were right, it just means these were motivations for them. Um, and another thing is that Romans believed that Jesus was resurrected on Sunday. Uh, we know that that's not quite correct. Um, and, and that's part of the reason for Sunday also. They, they, they pumped up Sunday because of the resurrection day, and they considered that to be a special day. So they had um, all of those kind of social factors going on that were uh, driving them in, in that direction. But there was also a bit more to it that needs to be thought about. Power politics was a big thing in the Roman church, and, and they still do that today. Um, power and authority are a big thing that they wield and always have wielded. And their situation, uh, I got my laser pointer here. Um, 
originally there were three C's. Now a C is like um, a head of government um, in, in, in charge. There was Rome, which is one of the C's. There was Antioch over here, which is just north of Israel. And there was Alexandria. Those were the original cores of Christianity. And, and these um, cores, Rome from the start always felt that it should be the first of these equals. It always thought that it should be the greatest of these three. And, and the other three said, no, that's not right. We're just all three separate. We, we go our own ways. Nobody's in charge of us. And Rome never liked that. They always thought, felt because they were um, the capital of the world, they should also be the capital of Christianity. And they didn't accept the idea that they weren't. Ultimately, um, there, there came to be five C's, um, and we'll talk a little bit about that some more. Um, Constantinople was added, um, and it, Constantinople was added because Constantine um, created that city, and he created that city just before Rome collapsed. Um, uh, not long after um, he created that city, barbarians started running through Rome, slaying people, and uh, pretty much Rome fell and Constantinople became the head of the Roman Empire, or what was left of the Roman Empire. Uh, so it was also one of the seas and, and became that. And also later on, Jerusalem was declared a sea, although it was largely a, a symbolic thing because Jerusalem was a pile of rubble at the time, having been destroyed by the Romans a few hundred years before. So, um, so these five seas um, were, the, were the seas, the centers of Christianity. And um, part of the reason Part, or at least part of the motivation for the Romans was um, you can show that you have power over people if you can make them do what you want them to do. And, and so, uh, and that's power politics. That is, if I can make you do that, then I'm obviously your leader. And they did that with Sabbath. Um, uh, right, even today, there are people who say that the Pope was justified in, in moving the Sabbath to Sunday because God didn't stop him. And, and so the fact that he succeeded justifies the fact that he did it. And that's just wrong in all sorts of ways. Nonetheless, um, power politics was definitely a big player in that. Rome felt that they should be the head, and uh, they were trying to boss people around. And we'll see that as more things come up here with Polycratus. So the next person who runs into trouble with the Church of Rome about this is Polycratus. Um, I won't even guess what Kratus means. The Church of Rome um, still had no power to enforce its views. Uh, Polycarp had told them you're doing wrong, and they said we're going to keep on doing it anyway. Um, and now here we are, um, 40 years later, and there's different people in charge of the churches in Asia Minor. And uh, the Church of Rome goes to them and says, "We've we've set the date for um, Passover, and it's time you guys started following that date. We're we're not going to accept you holding out on us anymore." And so this starts another big fight about this topic. And by this time, power has uh, increased in Rome. They, they have some of power, but not as much as they want. They can't really enforce their views so far away in Asia Minor. Uh, and if you remember that map, um, Asia Minor was kind of on the right-hand side there. That was where one of the seas were. And so it was a fair distance, and the Church of Rome simply didn't have the ability to enforce its views at that time. Nonetheless, they were demanding that the people in Asia Minor started uh, observing um, Passover at the same time that they did. And um, they the best that they could do was they would mock the Christians from Asian Minor. Anybody who stuck to that Nisan 14 date for Passover, they would mock them and make fun of them. And, and they started calling them quarto decimans, which means 14ers. So these are people who are much too rigid and inflexible and, and too legalistic. And those are words that we see even in our time is, those, is when liberals want to change things in the church and you say, no, the Bible says do it this way. And they say, no, we want to do it this way. They start calling you legalistic or they call you inflexible or things like that. So it's a, the same technique was being used back then. Uh, the Church of Rome was trying to embarrass them and make them stand out and, and be uh, out the subject of scorn and, and uh, laughter. And um, that was the best that they could do at that time. So uh, 40 years after this with Polycarp, uh, so this is now around 195 AD, Polycratus is the next person who runs into this thing. He's the bishop of the Church of Ephesus. If you remember the letter to the Ephesians from the Bible, that's to the same church, and he's the bishop of that church now. Um, and, and so the Church of Rome, as I said, has a little more power now, but, but they still don't have enough that they can force their will on, on other churches. Uh, later on, they will. 
So, but it still saw itself as the primary church and, and wanted that role of being the number one see, the, the head of that. And if you've ever heard um, the Pope being called the see of Rome, that's what they're talking about, is that he's the leader of the, the see, the Roman see that I was talking about earlier. Are and so, actually use the Holy See sometimes? Yeah, the Holy See, yeah. How would you spell C? Like a regular body of water? No, like S-E-E. Um, yeah, but it's a word we don't use that much. Uh, pretty much only the Catholic Church uses that word. <laughs> um, but that, yeah, it, it comes probably from Greek because uh, the, the whole C system was um, a Greek hierarchy system for managing stuff. And, yeah, don't worry about that, but S-E-E is the spelling. Um, so um, what happens here is that... Um, it was uh, about to change or had changed the date again. And the Bishop of Rome uh, called Victor, sent a letter to the churches in the East demanding that they observe Passover on this new date that they had set up. And, um, and as most other churches were doing, by this time, the Church of Rome had expanded quite a bit. It, it had produced a religion that men liked, people liked, I shouldn't, mankind liked. Um, and uh, it was attracting a lot of people to it. It had uh, grandeur in it, and it had all sorts of uh, things to worship, and it had lots of idols to worship, things like that. And so it was attracting a lot of people in, into churches that were based on the Roman ideas. And um, so there were a lot of um, Roman-style Christian churches, and not that many of the Eastern churches. And, and so there were definitely a, a majority that they had at this point, but they still didn't have enough that they could force the Eastern churches to do this. But most other churches at that time were following uh, the changes that Rome had made in the date for Passover. So Polycratus, um, as I said, by this time the Church of Rome has changed the date. The new date is now not related to Nisan 14 at all. It's the, the date for uh, Easter Sunday as we, we refer to it, and that's based on the moon something or other. I don't even remember how that's done. So, um, and this change, what happens with this change is that Passover now moves to a Friday and becomes called Good Friday, and Resurrection Sunday becomes the important day. And, and so it's not just a change from Passover, it's changed to really, this was the wave sheaf offering day from Judaism. Um, they're now calling it Resurrection Sunday, and so they've moved that day to Sunday instead of moving Passover to Sunday. So they pretty much abandoned Passover as an important thing. And so Victor, in this letter that he sends out, he speaks of all the noble Roman elders who kept Passover on this new day, and, and he's trying to convince the people of the East that they should change because of all these noble Roman elders. And we'll see in Polycarp's response, I, I've got some uh, part of that response for us to look at, um, that his response is, uh, we have much more notable people than you. We have real apostles as our foundation. We have Polycarp. We have a whole bunch of other people he's going to list. And, and these all kept Nisan 14 for Passover, no other day than that. And so um, what we're going to go through here is um, a, a person, a church historian called Eusebius records what Polycarp wrote in that in the response. And so we'll dig into that a little bit. And the first line of that is, we observe the exact day, neither adding nor taking away. Now think about that for a moment. What is he saying? What does it mean, not adding or taking away? Not moving it around? More than that, biblically. Does the Bible, does the Bible talk about that? Yeah. Yeah. The Bible does. It says, don't add or take away. Don't go to the left. Don't go to the right. And in Revelation, it says, if you add or take away, I will take away from you. And, and, and so that's what he's referencing. He's saying, you people are not doing what the Bible uh, says. Uh, we observe the act, act, exact day. We don't add or take away. And the inference is, you guys are the ones to adding and taking away. It just so reminds me what you're talking about, of when I figured it out and I had forgot being raised Catholic yeah. and never really reading the Bible. And then me reading the Bible and I'm saying, hey, why do we do this as a Catholic when the Bible tells you that it's wrong? Right. That was just mind blowing. Yeah, yeah. And that's. I'll go off track a little bit for a moment here. <laughs> uh, they, it became necessary in the Protestant time, when the Protestants in the 1500s uh, were uh, separating from Rome, for them to make their own Bible to justify the changes they had made. So there is a Roman Catholic Bible that has been modified to match up with Roman Catholic teachings. Okay, so um, this is the, continuing the response that Polycratus sent to Rome. And he says, for in Asia, now this is Asia Minor, also great lights have fallen asleep, 
which shall rise again on the day of the Lord's coming, when he shall come with glory from heaven and shall seek out all the saints. Among these, among these people who, are, who have been in Asia Minor, who are the great saints here, was Philip, one of the twelve apostles, who fell asleep in Hierapolis, and his two aged virgin daughters, and another daughter, who lived in the Holy Spirit, and now rests at Ephesus. And moreover, John, who was a witness and a teacher, who reclined on the bosom of the Lord, so we're talking about John the Apostle, who wrote the book of John and the books, uh, first, second, and third John, um, he says, was one of our people. And, and he says, and being a priest, he wore the sacerdotal plate, he fell asleep at Ephesus. So he's talking about these are the great lights that we have in the church of Asia Minor, and they are apostles. And, and he says, and remember Polycarp in Smyrna, who was a bishop and a martyr, and uh, Thrasus, bishop and martyr from Eumenia, who fell asleep in Smyrna. Why would I mention the bishop and martyr Sagarius, who fell asleep in Laodicea, or the blessed Papyrus, or Melito, the eunuch, who lived altogether in the Holy Spirit, and who lies in Sardis, awaiting the episcopate, the kingdom from heaven, when he shall arise from the dead? So I've gone through a list of all these people that the Romans would have known as great lights of, of the Eastern Church, who were apostles or very close to apostles, and, um, and saying, you've listed your people, here's our people, where our people are much closer to the apostles. And he says, all these observed the 14th day of the Passover according to the gospel, deviating in no respect, but following the rule of faith. And I also, Polycratus, the least of all of you, do according to the tradition of my relatives, some of whom I have closely followed. For seven of my relatives were bishops, and I am the eighth, and my relatives always observe the day when the people put away the leaven. So 14th of Nisan, he's saying, when, when um, we eat unleavened bread. And, and so he's, he's saying, all of these people, all these great lights uh, of the uh, Eastern Church who are apostles or directly related to apostles, all kept Nisan 14. And so, uh, summing up, he says, I therefore, brethren, who have lived 65 years in the Lord, and have met with the brethren throughout the world, and have gone through every holy scripture, am not affrighted by terrifying words. So he's saying, the words of threats that you've sent me in your letter, I'm not af afraid of those. For those greater than I have said, we ought to obey God rather than man. So that's a quote from the Bible. And, he's, and so his inference is, you guys are disobeying God by changing the date. So he says, um, I could mention the, the bishops who were present, whom I summoned at your desire, whose names, should I write them, would constitute a great multitude. And they, beholding my littleness, gave their consent to this letter, knowing that I did not bear my gray hairs in vain, but had always governed my life by the Lord Jesus. So he's saying, we're going to keep on doing what the Bible says, and we're not going to change. Um, we, you've tried to get us to change. You've tried to make us afraid of what you can do to us. We're not going to accept that. We're going to reject you. Reject you. And so this kind of ties back to last week's lesson about people trying to force you to do wrong things and having the courage to stand up, because sometimes it does take a lot of courage to stand up. And, and as I said, right now, the Church of Rome doesn't have that much power, but very quickly, they will have enough power. <clears throat> How am I doing for time? Ten minutes. Okay, I'm gonna. But, but the point was that uh, um, they must have had a lot of power during the Inquisition in Spain. Oh, where yes. They uh, beheaded a lot of people there, and, yeah. and that's why we wound up getting a lot of people from Spain here in America because they just ran away, you know. Yeah, yeah, they got to the point where they made kings. And they decided who was going to be kings of countries. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they were ruthless. As I said, they executed people um, for the smallest infraction. Okay, I'm just going to try to tie this up real quick, quick here uh, for today. So after that, so we had Polycarp at first. Um, the Church of Rome rejected him. Then we have Polycratus, and they, they say, no, we're not going to do what you're, you're telling us to, to do. We're not going to accept that. But... Uh, a little bit later, in uh, 312 AD, um, um, there's a first council of Nicaea, and it is a get-together of all the bishops of all the churches, and they're going to decide some uh, questions about the church. And so this happens with um, um, Constantine, as I mentioned before. He was the one who set up the, tr the city called Constantinople. Um, he, he came to power. He became the Western emperor and converted to Christianity in 312. Um, a lot of people are suspect about him. A lot of people him blame him for things that happened to the church. But as we can see here, 
Um, this change to the date for Passover was not done by him. It was done by the Church of Rome long before they started that process, before he even existed. And so, but anyway, um, so this guy became the the Western Emperor. So uh, Western Rome, he became the emperor of that at, at first. And then a little bit later on, he becomes the emperor of all of Rome, the, the Western and the Eastern. I won't go into the details of why that was. Anyway, so um, a year later, after he converts to Christianity, um, he issues an edict um, of, it's called the Edict of Milan, that legalized Christianity. So now Christianity has been around for like 250 years as an illegal religion, and now suddenly it becomes a legal religion in all of the Roman Empire. And so people aren't going to be executed anymore for being Christians. And, uh, and so that was a caused a major change in Christianity. Uh, it, it exploded in the number of people who came into the faith because no longer were they in, in danger of losing their lives. And uh, so uh, a few years later, um, he becomes the sole emperor, the emperor of all of Rome, and, and claims to be a Christian. Some people doubt that, whatever. Um, so he, he uh, brings this council together. Uh, here's a quote here from Wikipedia. The first council of nice Nicaea was convened by Consti Constantine, one, upon the recommendations of a synod led by Hosius of Cordova in 325. So uh, the Catholic Church called a synod, which is a meeting together of um, authorities, and, and they decided that there needed to be this Council of Nicaea to work out these problems that were in the church. And there are a whole bunch of problems. Um, we won't get into all of them, but one of them was the nature of Jesus. Um, was he all, all man, or was he a man and God mixed together? And if he was man and God mixed together, just exactly how was he mixed together? And this was a big question at that time. And so what, that was one of the things that they were going to decide is exactly who Jesus was in that sense. Um, and, but another thing that they are going to deal with was the day of Passover. And so, as I said before, some people claim that Constantine was the one who changed the date of Passover, but that's not correct. What happens at the Council of Nicaea is they take what the Roman Catholic Church had been uh, forcing or trying to force on everybody and say, this is now the official date in Christianity for Passover. And, and that's what it's going to be from now on. Okay, I'm going to do this and then we'll call it quits. Okay, um, in this church uh, and in others, um, there's a phrase called Lord's Supper or sometimes Last Supper that is used. Um, that comes after this Council of Nicaea. Um, up until that time, no one ever seemed to be using the words Lord's Supper or Last Supper. The first written mention of that comes in, in 420 AD, and that's by a man called Augustine. And he doesn't even use it in the sense of being an observance. Um, he, he says it more like um, it was the Last Supper that Jesus would eat. And so that's the first kind of mention of Last Supper as, as a phrase. Um, but nonetheless, this phrase came to be common and, and commonly used uh, by people in the, in the Church of Rome and the whole Roman Empire of Christianity. And uh, ultimately, it appears that the Greek manuscripts came, got changed so that a phrase in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, verse 20, now talks about um, this Lord's Supper, it says. And, um, and it appears that that is an addition to the Bible that they made to help people understand it. Um, because um, it, nobody talked about it. That, that phrase simply wasn't used at that time that the Bible was written. Um, so it, they believed that that was something that was changed. So uh, the Church of God, Seventh Day, uh, originally believed the Lord's Supper was Passover. Uh, they just used the word Lord's Supper uh, in, and, or Passover, but they kind of used Lord's Supper more. And then along came this person called Herbert W. Armstrong, and he was trying to find the real true church and, and ultimately joined the Church of God, Seventh Day. But before he did that, he disagreed with them originally. He thought that the, the idea was that the Lord's Supper replaced Passover, that it was a, a new thing and a different thing that, that Jesus had instituted and, and was something different from Passover. But once he joined the Church of God Seventh Day and started thinking about it some more, he decided that um, they were the same thing. And, and in fact, he decided that, the Lord, that Lord's Supper, that word, wasn't the best name for it, and then the Passover was a, a better name for it. So if you're curious about how those two words or two phrases came into existence, that's how it was. Okay, so I'm going to stop here. We'll pick it up um, next week and finish off. There's still quite a bit more to go through.